ओके ये शुड बी गुड ऑल राइट तो चैप्टर 11 ऑफ लॉर्ड ऑफ द रिंग्स अ नाइफ इन द डार्क एज दे प्रिपेयर्ड फॉर स्लीप एट ब्री द डार्क darkness lay on buckland a mist strayed in the dells and along the river bank the house at cricket hall for callow stood silent betty bulger opened it the door cautiously and peered out a feeling of fear had been growing on him all day and he was unable to go to rest or go to bed there was a brooding threat in the breathless n- night air as he stared out into the gloom a black shadow moved upon under the trees The gate seemed to open of its own accord and close again close again without a sound terror seized him he shrank back and for a moment he stood trembling in the hall then he shut and locked the door the night deepened there came the soft sound of horses led with stealth along the lane outside the gate they stopped and three black figures entered like shades of night creeping across the ground one went to the door one to the corner of the house on either side and there they stood as still as the shadows of stones all night slowly went on the house and the quiet trees seemed to be waiting breathlessly there was a faint stir in the leaves and a cock crowed far away the cold hour before dawn was passing the figure by the door moved in the dark without moon or stars a drawn blade gleamed as if a chill light had been unsheathed there was a blow soft but heavy and the door shuddered open in the name of mordor said a voice thin and menacing at a second blow the door yielded and fell back with timbers burst and lock broken the black figures passed swiftly in at that moment among the trees nearby a horn rang out it rent the night like fire on a hilltop awake fear fire foes awake fatty bulger had not been idle as soon as he saw the dark shapes creep from the garden he knew that he must run for it or perish and run he did out of the back door through the garden and over the fields when he reached the nearest house more than a mile away he collapsed on the doorstep no 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 he was crying no not me i haven't got it was some time before anyone could make out what he was babbling about at last they got the idea that enemies were in buckland some strange invasion from the old forest and they lost no more time fear fire foes the brandy bucks were blowing the horn call all of buckland that had not been sounded for a hundred years not since the white wolves came in the fell winter when the brandy wine was frozen over awake wake far away answering horns were heard the alarm was spreading the black figures fled from the house one of them left let fall a hop at cloak on the step as he ran in the lane the noise of hoofs broke out and gathering to a gallop went hammering away in the darkness All about Crick Hollow there was the sound of horns blowing and voices crying and feet running but the black riders rode like a gale to the north gate let the little people blow Sauron would would deal with them later meanwhile they had another errand they knew now that the house was empty and the ring had gone they rode down the guards at the gate and vanished from the shire in the early night Frodo woke from deep sleep Suddenly, as if some sound or presence had disturbed him, he saw that Strider was sitting alert in his chair. His eyes gleamed in the light of the fire, which had been tended and was burning brightly, but he made no sign or movement. Frodo soon went to sleep again, but his dreams were again troubled with the noise of of wind and of galloping hoofs. The wind seemed to be curling around the house and shaking it. And far off he heard a horn blowing wildly. He opened his eyes and heard a cock crowing lustily in the inn yard. Strider had drawn the curtains and pushed back the shutters with a clang. The first gray light of day was in the room, and a cold air was coming through the open window. As soon as Strider had roused them all, 
he led the way to their bedrooms. When they saw them, they were glad they had taken his advice. The windows had been forced open and were swinging, and the curtains were flapping. The beds were tossed about, and the, bols the bolsters slashed and flung upon the floor. The brown mat was torn to pieces. Strider immediately went to fetch the landlord. Poor Mr. But Butterbur looked sleepily looked sleepy and frightened. He had Clark hardly closed his eyes all night, so he said, but he had never heard a sound. Never has such a thing happened in my time, he cried, raising his hands in order. Guests unable to, guests unable to sleep in their best beds and good bolsters ruined and all. What are we coming to? Dark times, said the strider, but for present you may be left in peace. When you have got rid of us, we will leave at once. Never mind about breakfast. A drink and a bite standing will have to do. We shall be packed in a few minutes. Mr. Butterbur hurried off to see that their ponies were, were got ready and to fetch them a bite. Very soon he came back in dismay. The ponies had vanished. The stable doors had all, had, had all been opened in the night, and they were gone. Not only Mary's ponies, but every other horse and beast in the place. Berta was crushed by the news. How could they help to reach Rivendell on foot, pursued by mounted enemies? They might as well set out for the moon. Dryder sat silent for a while, looking at the hobbits, as if he was weighing up their strength and courage. Ponies would not help us to escape horsemen, he said at last, thoughtfully, as if he, he guessed what Frodo had in mind. We should not go much slower on foot, not on the roads that I mean to take. I was going to walk in any case. It is the food and stores that trouble me. We cannot count on getting anything to eat between here and Rivendell, except what we take with us, and we ought to take plenty to spare, for we may be delayed or forced to go round about, far out of the direct way. How much are you prepared to carry on your backs? As much as we, as much as we, as we must," said Pippin with a sinking heart but trying to show that he was tougher than he looked or felt. I can... I can carry enough for two, said Sam defiantly. Can't anything be done, Mr. Butter... Er, asked Frodo. Can't we get a couple of ponies in the village? Or even just for the baggage? I don't suppose we could hire them, but we might be able to buy them, he outed doubtfully, wondering if he could afford it. I, I doubt it, said the landlord unhappily. Two or three riding ponies that there were in Bree were stabled in my yard, and they're gone. As for other animals, horses or ponies, or draught or whatnot, there are very few of them in Bree, and they won't be for sale, but I'll do what I can. I'll rout out Bob and send him round as soon as, as, soon as may be. Yes, said Shredder reluctantly, you had better do that. I'm afraid we shall have to try to get one pony at least, but... So ends all hope of starting early and slipping away quietly. We might as well have blown a horn to announce our departure. That was part of their plan, no doubt. There is one cr there's one crumb of comfort, said Mary, and more than a crumb, I hope. We can have breakfast while we wait and sit down to it. Let's get hold of Nob. In the end, there was more than three hours' delay. Bob came back with the report that no horse or pony was to be got for love or money in the neighborhood, except one. Bill Fernie had one that he might possibly sell. A poor old half-starved creature it is, said Bob, but he won't pay part with it for less than thrice its worth. Seeing how you're placed, not if I know it's Bill Fernie. Bill Fernie, said Frodo, isn't there some trick? Wouldn't the beast bolt back to him with all our stuff? Our help in tracking us or something? I wonder, said Strider, but I cannot imagine any animal running home to him. Once it got away, I fancy this is only an afterthought of kind Master Fernie's, just a way of increasing his profits from the affair. The chief danger is that the poor beast is probably at death's door, but there does not seem any choice. What does he want for it? Bill Fernie's price was twelve silver pennies, and that was indeed at least three times the pony's value in those parts. It proved to be a bony, underfed, and dispirited animal, but it did not look like dying just yet. Mr. Butterbur paid for it himself, 
and offered Mary another eighteen pence as some compensation for the lost animals. He was an honest man, and well off as names were reckoned in Bree, but thirty silver pennies was a sore blow to him. Being cheated by Bill Fernie made it harder to bear. As a matter of fact, he came out on the right side in the end. It turned out later that only one horse had been actually stolen. The others had been driven off, or had bolted in terror, and were found wandering in different corners of the Breeland. Mary po Mary's ponies had escaped altogether, and eventually, having a good deal of sense, they made their way to the Downs in search of Fatty Lumpkin. But they came under the care of Tom Bombadil for a while, and were well off. But when news of the events at Bree came to Tom's ears, he sent them to Mr. Butterbear, who thus got five good beasts at a very fair price. They had to work harder in Bree, but Bob treated them well. So on the whole, they were lucky. They missed a dark and dangerous journey, but they never came to Rivendell. However, in the meanwhile, for all Mr. Butterbear knew, his money was gone for good or, f or for bad, and he had other troubles. For there was a great commotion as soon as the remaining guests were astir and heard news of the raid on the inn. The southern travelers had, had lost several horses and blamed the innkeeper loudly. It became known that one of their own number had also disappeared into the, in the night, and that other than Bill Fernie's squint-eyed companion. Suspicion fell on, on him at once. You pick, up the, you pick up with the horse thief and bring him to my house, said Butterbury Lee. You ought to pay for all the damage yourselves and not come shouting at me. Go and ask Mr. Fernie what where your handsome friend is. It appeared that he was nobody's friend, and nobody could recollect what he had joined their party. After their breakfast, the hobbits had to repack and get together further supplies for the longer journey they were now expecting. It was close on ten o'clock before they at last got off. But that, by that time, the whole Labrie was buzzing with excitement. Frodo's vanishing trick, the appearance of the Black Horseman, the robbing of the stables, and not least the news that Strider the Ranger had joined the mysterious hobbits, made such a tale as would last for many uneventful years. Most of the inhabitants of Bree and Stadel, and, mi and many even from Combe and Archet, were crowded in the, in the road to see the travelers start. The other guests in the inn were at the doors or hanging out of the windows. Strider had changed his mind, and had decided to leave Bree by the main road. Any attempt to set off across country at once would only make matters worse. Half the inhabitants would follow them, see th what they were, were up to, and to prevent them from trespassing. They said farewell to Nob and Bob, and took leave of Mr. Butterbur with many thanks. I hope we shall meet again some day, when things are merry once more, said Frodo. I should like nothing better than to stay in her house in peace for a while. They tramped off, anxious and downhearted, under the eyes of the crowd. Not all the faces were friendly, nor all the words that were shouted. But Strider seemed to be held in awe by most of the Brelanders, and those that he stared at shut their mouths and drew away. He walked in front with Frodo, next came Merry and Pippin, and last came Sam leading the pony which was laden with as much of their baggage as they had the heart to, get, to give it. But already it looked less dejected, as if it approved of the change in its fortunes. Hi, Avian, and thank you for the fluid check. Sam was chewing an apple thoughtfully. He had a pocket full of them, a parting present from Nob and Bob. Apple... Apples for walking, and a pipe for sitting, he said. But I reckon I'll, I'll miss them bo both before long. The hobbits took no notice of the inquisitive heads that peeped out of doors, or popped over walls and fences as they passed. But as they drew near to the further gate, Frodo saw a dark, ill-kept house behind a thick hedge, the last house in the village. In one of the windows, he caught a glimpse of a sallow face with sly, slanting eyes, but it vanished at once. So that's where that southerner is hiding, he thought. He looks more than half like a goblin. Off the hedge, another man was staring boldly. He had heavy black brows and dark, scornful eyes. His large mouth curled in a sneer. He was smoking a short black pipe. 
As they approached, he took it out of his mouth and spat. Morning, morning, Long Shanks, he said. Off early, found some friends at last. Strider nodded, but did not answer. Morning, my little friends, he said to the others. I suppose you know who you've taken up with. That stick it not Strider, that is. Though I've heard other names not so pretty. Watch out tonight. And you, Sammy, don't go ill treating my poor old pony. Ha! He spat again. Sam turned quickly. And you, Fernie, he said. Put your ugly face out of sight, or it'll get hurt. The sudden flick, quick as lightning, an apple left his hand and hit Bill square on the nose. Ducked too late, and curses came from behind the hedge. Waste of a good apple, said Sam regretfully and strode on. At last they left the village behind. The escort of children and stragglers that had followed them got tired and turned back at the south gate. Passing through, they kept on along the road for some miles. Okay, wait. Better change the different music. Uh... Okay, I think this should be good. This should be good. Passing through, they kept on along the road for some miles. It bent to the left, curving back into its eastward line as it rounded the feet to Bree Hill and then it began to run swiftly downwards into wooded country. To the left, they could see some of the houses and hobbit holes of Stadel on the gentler southeastern slopes of the hill. Down into, into a deep hollow away north of the road, there were wisps of rising smoke that showed where Combe lay, Arshit was hidden in the trees beyond. After the road had run down some way and had left Bree Hill standing tall and brown behind, they came on a narrow track that led them off towards the north. This is where we we'll leave the open and take to cover, said Strider. Not a shortcut, I hope. My last shortcut through the woods nearly ended de in disaster. Ah, but you had not got me with you then, laughed Strider. My cut, short or long, don't go wrong. He took a long up and down the road. No one was in sight and he led the way quickly down towards the wooded valley. His plan, as far as they could understand it without knowing the country, was to go to, towards Archit at first, but to bear right and pass it, it on the east, and then to steer as straight as he could over the wild lands to Weathertop Hill. And that way they would, if all went well, cut off a great loop of the road, which further on bent southwards to avoid the Midgewater Marshes. But of course, they would have to pass through the marshes themselves, and Strider's description of them was not encouraging. However, in the meanwhile, walking was not unpleasant. Indeed, if it had not been for the disturbing events of the night before, they would have enjoyed this part of the journey better than any up to that time. Okay, maybe this music doesn't... Sounds like it doesn't fit this... Chapter's called Knife in the Dark, so I don't. Okay, I think that's a work better. The woods in the valley were still leafy and full of color, and seemed peaceful and wholesome. Strider guided them confidently among the many crossing paths, although left to themselves they would soon have been at lost. He was taking a wandering course with many turns and dumplings, put off any pursuit. Mill Fernie will have watched where we left the road for certain, he said, though I don't think he will follow us himself. He knows the land round here well enough. But he knows he is not a match for me in a wood. It is what he may tell others that, that I'm afraid of. 
I don't suppose they are far away. If they think we have made for Ratchet, so much the better. Whether because of Strider's skill or for some other reason, they saw no sign and heard no sound of any other living thing all that day. Neither two-footed, except birds, nor four-footed, except one fox and a few squirrels. The next day, they began to steer a steady course eastwards. Still, all was quiet and peaceful. On the third day out from Bree, they came out of the Chetwood. The land had been falling steadily ever since they turned aside from the road, and they now entered a wide, flat expanse of country, much more difficult to manage. They were far beyond the borders of the Breeland, out in the pathless, pathless wildernesses, and drawing near to the Midgewater Marshes. The ground now became damp, damp, and in places boggy, and here and there they came upon pools and wide stretches of reeds and brushes filled with the warbling of little hidden birds. They had to pick their way carefully to keep both dry-footed and on their pro proper course. At first they made fair progress, but as they went on, their passage became slower and more dangerous. The marshes were bewildering and treacherous, and there was no permanent trail even for rangers to find through their shifting quagmires. The fl flies began to torment them, and the air was full of clouds of tiny midges that, that crept up their sleeves and breeches and into, into their hair. Hmm. That, that sounds fun. That sounds fun. Being eaten alive, cried Pippin. Midgewater, there are more midges than water. What do they, do they live on when, when they can't get Hobbit? Asked Sam, scratching his neck. They spent a miserable day in this lonely and unpleasant country. Their camping place was damp, cold, and unforgettable. The biting insects would not let them sleep. There was also abominable creatures haunting the reeds and tussocks. But from the sound of them were evil relatives of the cricket. There were thousands of them. And they squeak all around. Neek, breek, neek, breek, neek. Unceasingly all the night, until the hobbits were nearly frantic. The next day, the fourth was little better, and the night almost as comfortless. Though the neeker breakers, as Sam called them, had been left behind, the midges still pursued them. As Fro Frodo lay, tired but unable to close his eyes, it seemed to him that far away there came a light in the eastern sky, it flashed and faded many times. It was not the dawn, for that was still some hours off. What is that light? He said. Ugh. What is that light? He said to Strider, who had risen and was standing, gazing ahead into the night. I do not know, Strider answered. It is too distant to make out. It is like lightning that leaps up from the hilltops. Frodo lay down again, but for a long while he could still see the white flashes and against them the tall, dark figure of Strider, standing silent and watchful. At last he passed into uneasy sleep. They had not gotten far on the fifth day when they left this last straggling pools and rebeds of the marshes behind them. The land before them began steadily to rise again. Way in the distant eastwards they could now see a line of hills. The highest of them was at at the right of the line, and a, la and a little separated from the others. It had a canonical top, slightly flattened at the, s at the summit. That is weather top, said Strider. The old road we have left far away on our right runs to the south of it, and passes not far from its foot. We might reach it by noon tomorrow if we go straight towards it. I suppose we had better do so. What do you mean? asked Frodo. I mean, when we do get there, not certain what we shall find is close to the road. But surely we are hoping to find Gandalf there. Yes, but the hope is faint. If he comes this way at all, he may not pass through Bree, and so he may not know what we are what we are doing. And anyway, unless by luck we arrive almost together, 
We shall miss one another. It will not be safe for him or for us to wait there long. If the riders fail to find us in the wilderness, they are likely to make for Weathertop themselves. It commands a wide view all around. Indeed, there are many birds and beasts in this country that could see us as we stand here from that hilltop. Not all the birds are to be trusted. There are other spies more evil than they are. The hobbits looked anxiously at the distant hills. Sam looked up into the pale sky, fearing to see hawks or eagles hovering over them with bright, unfriendly eyes. You do make... You, you do make me feel uncomfortable and lonesome, Strider, he said. What do you advise us to do? asked Frodo. I think, answered Strider slowly, as if he was not quite sure. I think the best thing is to go as straight eastward from here as we can, to make for the line of hills, not for Weathertop. There we can strike a path I know that runs at their feet. It will bring us up to Weathertop from the north and less openly. Then we shall see what we shall see. All that day they plodded along until the cold and early evening came down. The land became drier and more barren, but mists and vapors lay behind them on the marshes. A few melancholy birds were piping and wailing, till the round red sun sank slowly into the western shadows, and an empty silence fell. The hobbits thought of the soft light of sunset glancing through the cheerful windows of Bag End far away. At day's end, they came to a stream that wandered down from the hill to lose itself in the stagnant marshland, and they went up along its banks where the light lasted. It was already night when at last they halted and made their camp under some stunted alder trees by the shores of the stream. Ahead there loomed now against the dusky sky the bleak and treeless backs of the hills. That night, they set a watch, and Strider, it seemed, did not sleep at all. The moon was waxing and in the early night hours a cold gray light lay on the land. Next morning they set out again and soon after sunrise. There was a frost in the air, and the sky was a pale clear blue. The hobbits felt refreshed, as if they had had a night of unbroken sleep. Already they were getting used to much walking on short commons, shorter at any rate, but in the shire they would have thought barely enough to keep them on their legs. Pippin declared that Frodo was looking twice the hobbit that he, he had been. Very odd, said Frodo, tightening his belt, considering that there is actually a good deal less of me. I hope the thinning process will not go on indefinitely, or I shall become a wraith. Do not speak of such things, said Strider quickly, with surprising earnestness. The hills drew nearer. They made an undulating ridge, often rising almost to a thousand feet and here and there, falling again to low clefts, our passes leading into the eastern land, land beyond. Along the crest of their ridge, the hobbits could see what looked to be the remains of, of green-grown walls and dikes, and in the clefts there still st stood the ruins of old works of stone. By night, they had reached the feet of the westward slopes, and there they camped. It was the night of the 5th of October, and they were six days out from Bree. In the morning they found, for the first time since they had left the Chetwood, a track plain to see. They turned right and followed it southwards. It ran cunningly, taking a line that seemed chosen so as to keep as much hidden as possible from the view, both of the hilltops above and of the flats to the west. It dived into dells and hugged steep banks, and where it passed over flatter and more open ground on either side of it, there were lines of large boulders and hewn stones that screened the travelers almost like a hedge. I wonder who made this I wonder who made this path and what for? said Mary as they walked along one of these avenues, where the stones were unusually large and closely set. I'm not sure that I not sure that I like it. It's a well a barrow whitish look. Is there any barrow on on Weathertop? No, there is no barrow on Borrow on Weathertop, 
nor in any of these hills, answered Strider. The men of the west did not live here, but in their latter days they defended the hills for a while against the evil that came out of Angmar. This path was made to serve the forts along the walls, but long before, in the first days of the North Kingdom, they built a great watchtower on Weathertop. Amon Sul, they called it. It was burned and broken, and nothing remains of it now but a tumbled, a tumbled ring, like a rough crown on the old hill's head. Yet, once it was tall and fair, it is told that Elendil stood there watching for the coming of Gil-galad, out of the west in the days of the last alliance. The hobbits gazed at Strider. It seemed that he was le learned in old lore, as well as in the ways of the wild. Who is Gilgalad? It's Mary, but Strider did not answer, and seemed to be lost in thought. Suddenly a low voice murmured, Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing, the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. His sword was long, his lance was keen, his shining helmet afar was seen. The countless stars of heaven's field were mirrored in his silver shield. But long ago he rode away, and where he dwelleth none can say. For into darkness fell his star, in Mordor, where the shadows are. The others turned in amazement, for the voice was Sam's. Don't, s don't stop, said Mary. That's all I know, stammered Sam, blushing. I learned it from Mr. Bilbo when I was a lad. He used to tell me tales like that. No one how I was always one for hearing about elves. It was Mr. Bilbo as taught me my letters. He was mighty book learned it was was dear old Mr. Bilbo, and he wrote poetry. He wrote what I have just said. He did not make it up, said Strider. It is part of the lay that is called the Fall of Gilgalad, which is in an ancient tongue. Bilbo must have translated it. I never knew that. There was a lot more, said Sam, all about Mordor. I didn't learn that part. It gave me the shivers. I never thought I should be going that way myself. Going to going to Mordor, cried Pippin. I hope it won't come to that. Do not speak that name so loudly, said Strider. It was already midday when they drew near the southern end of the path and saw before them, in the pale clear light of the October sun, a gray-green gray -green bank leading up like a bridge onto the northward slope of the hill. They decided to make for the top at once, while the daylight was broad. Concealment was no longer possible, and they could only hope that no enemy or spy was observing them. Nothing was to be seen moving on the hilltop. On the hill, if Gandalf was anywhere about, there was no sign of him. On the western flank of Weathertop, they found a sheltered hollow, at the bottom of which there was a bowl-shaped dell with grassy sides. There they left Sam and Pippin with the pony and their packs and luggage. The other three went on. After half an hour's plodding climb, Strider reached the crown of the hill. Frodo and Mary followed, tired and breathless. The last slope had been steep and rocky. On the top they found, as Strider had said, a wide ring of ancient stonework now crumbling or covered with age-long grass. But in the center, a cairn of broken stones had been piled. They were blackened as with fire. About them the turf was burned to the roots, and all within the ring the grass was scorched and shriveled as if flames had swept the hilltop. But there was no sign of any living thing. Standing upon the rim of the ruined circle, they saw all round below them a wide prospect. For the most parts of lands empty and feet featureless, except for patches of woodland away to the south, beyond which they caught here and there the glint of distant water. Beneath them on this southern side there ran like a ribbon up the old road, coming out of the west and winding up and down, until it faded behind a ridge of dark land to the east. Nothing was moving on it. Following its line eastward with their eyes they saw the mountains. The nearer foothills were brown and somber. Behind them stood taller shapes of grey, and behind those again were high white peaks glimmering among the clouds. Well here we are, well, here we are said Mary, and very cheerless and uninviting it looks. 
There is no water and no shelter and no sign of Gandalf. But I don't blame him for not waiting. He ever came here. I wonder, said Strider, looking around thoughtfully. Even if he was a day or two behind us at Bree, he could have arrived here first. He can ride very swiftly when he need presses. Suddenly he stooped and looked at the stone on the top of the cairn. It was flatter than the others and whiter as if it had escaped the fire. He picked it up and examined it, turning into his fingers. This has been handled recently, he said. What do you think of these marks? On the flat underside, Frodo saw some scratches. There seems to be a stroke, a dot, and three more strokes, he said. The stroke on the left might be a G rune with thin branches, Strider. It might be a sign left by Gandalf, but one cannot be sure. The scratches are fine, and they certainly look fresh, but the marks might mean something quite different and have nothing to do with us. Rangers use runes, and they come here sometimes. What could they mean, even if Gandalf made them? asked Mary. I should say, answered Strutter, that they stood for G3, and were a sign that Gandalf was here on October the 3rd. That is three days ago now. Oh, hello, welcome in. Thank you for coming by. It would also show that he was in a hurry and a danger was at hand, and that he had no time or did not dare to write anything longer or plainer. If that is so, we must be wary. Oh, it's going well. Thank you very much for asking. I hope yours is going well, too. I wish we could feel sure that he made the marks, whatever they mean, said Frodo. It'd be a great comfort to know that he was on the way in front of us, behind us. Perhaps, said Strider. For myself, I believe that he was here and was in danger. There have been scorching flames here, and now the light that we saw three nights ago in the eastern sky comes back to mind. I guess that he was attacked on this tilltop, but with what results I cannot tell. He is here no longer, and we must now look for ourselves and make our own way to Rivendell as best we can. How far is Rivendell? asked Mary, gazing round wearily. The world looked wild and wide from Weathertop. I don't know if the road has ever been measured in miles beyond the Forsaken Inn. A day's journey east of Bree, answered Strider. Some say it is so far, and some say otherwise. It's a strange road, and folk are glad to reach their journey's end, for the time is long or short. But I know how long it would take me on my own feet fair weather and no ill fortune. Twelve days from here to the ford of Abrunin, Abrunin, where the road crosses the loud water that runs out of Rivendell. We have at least a fortnight's journey before us, but I do not think we shall be able to use the road. Fortnight, said Frodo. What may happen in that time? It may, said Strider. They stood for a while silent on the hilltop near its southward edge. That lonely place, Frodo for the first time fully realized his homelessness and danger. He wished bitterly that his fortune had left him in the quiet and beloved Shire. He stared down at the hateful road, leading back westward to his home. Suddenly, he was aware that two black specks were moving slowly along it, going westward. And looking again, he saw that three others were creeping eastward to meet them. He gave a cry and clutched Strider's arm. Look, he said, pointing downwards. At once, Strider flung himself on the ground behind the ruined circle, pulling Frodo down beside him. Mary threw himself alongside. What is it? He whispered. I do not know, but I fear the worst, answered Strider. Slowly, they crawled up to the edge of the ring again and peered through a cleft between two jagged stones. The light was no longer bright, but the clear morning had faded and clouds creeping, creeping out of the east had now overtaken the sun as it began to go down. They could all see the black specks, but neither Frodo nor Mary could make out their shapes for certain. Yet something told them that there, far below, were black riders assembling on the road beyond the foot of the hill. Yes, Strider, whose 
Keener's sight left him in no doubt. The enemy is here. Hastily, they crept away and slipped down the north side of the hill to find their companions. Sam and Peregrine had not been idle. They had explored the small dell and the surrounding slopes. Not far away, they found a spring of clear water in the hillside, and near it, footprints not more than a day or two old. In the dell itself, they found recent traces of a fire and other signs of a hasty camp. There were some fallen rocks on the edge of the dell nearest to the hill. Behind them, Sam came upon a small store of firewood neatly stacked. I wonder if, if old Gandalf has has been up here, he said. That it, it, it been. Whoever it was put this stuff here. They're meant to come back, it seems. Strider was greatly interested in these discoveries. I wish I had waited and explored the ground down here myself, he said, hurrying off to the spring to examine the footprints. It's just as I feared, he said. When he came back, Sam and Pippin had trampled the soft ground. The marks are spoilt or confused. Rangers have been here lately. It is they who left the firewood behind. They are also several new newer tracks that were not made by rangers. At least one set was made, only a day or two ago, by heavy boots. At least one. I cannot now be certain, but I think there was many booted feet. He paused and stood in anxious thought. Each of the hobbits saw in his mind a vision of the cloaked and booted riders. If the horsemen had already found the dell, the sooner Strider led them somewhere else, the better. Sam viewed the hollow with, with great dislike. Now that he had heard news of their enemies on the road only a few miles away. Hadn't we better clear out quick, Mr. Strider? He asked impatiently. It is getting late, and I don't like this hole. It makes my heart sink somehow. Yes, we certainly must decide what to do at once, answered Strider, looking up and considering the time and the weather. Well, Sam, he said, I do not like this place either. I cannot think of any better that we should reach before nightfall. At least we are out of sight for the moment, and if we move we should be much more likely to be seen by spies. All we could do would be to go right out of our way north on this side of the line of hills, where the land is all much the same as it is here. The road is watched. We should have to cross it. We tried to take cover in the thickets away to the south. On the north side of the road beyond the hills, the country is bare and flat for miles. Can the riders see? asked Mary. I mean, they seem usually to have their noses. have used their noses rather than their eyes, smelling for us. If smelling is the right word, at least in the daylight. It made us lie down flat when you saw them down below. Now you talk of being seen if we move. I was too careless on the hilltop, answered Treader. I was very anxious to find some sign of Gandalf, but it was a mistake for three of us to go up and stand there so long. For the black horses can see, and the riders can use men and other creatures as spies as we found at Bree. They themselves do not see the world of light as we do, but our shapes cast shadows in their minds, which only the noon sun destroys, and in the dark they perceive many signs and forms that are hidden from us. Then they are they are most to be feared, and at all times they smell the blood of living things, desiring and hating it. Senses, too, there are other than sight or smell. We can feel their presence. It troubled our heart as soon as we came here. And before we saw them, they felt ours more keenly. Also, he added, and his voice sank to a whisper, the ring draws them. Is, is there no escape, then? said Frodo, looking around wildly. If I move, I shall be seen and hunted. If I stay, I shall be drawn to them. I shall draw them to me. Strider laid his hands on his shoulder. There is still hope, he said. You are not alone. Let us take this wood that, that is set ready for the fire as a sign. There is little shelter or defense here, but fire shall serve for both. Sauron can put fire to his evil uses, as he can all things. These riders do not love it and fear those who wield it. Fire is our friend in the wilderness. Maybe, muttered Sam. It is also as good a way of saying here we are as I can think of, our shouting. Down in the lowest and most sheltered corner of the dell, they lit a fire, prepared a meal. 
The shades of evening began to fall, and it grew cold. They were suddenly aware of great hunger, for they had not eaten anything since breakfast, but they dared not, not make more than a frugal supper. The lands ahead were empty of all save birds and beasts, unfriendly places deserted by all the races of the world. Rangers passed at times beyond the hills, but there were few, few and did not stay. Other wanderers were rare and of evil sorts. Trolls might stray down at times out of the northern valleys of the mystic mountains. Only on the road would travelers be found, most often dwarves, hurrying along on business of their own, with no help and few words to spare for strangers. I don't see how our, f our food can be made to last, said Frodo. We've been careful enough in the last few days, and this supper is no feast, but we have used more than we ought if we have two weeks still to go and perhaps more. There is food in the wild, Mr. Trotter, berry, root, and herb. And I have some skill as a, as a hunter at need. You need not be afraid of starving before winter comes. But gathering and catching food is long and weary work, and we need haste. So tighten your belts and think with hope of the tables of Elrond's house. Cold increased as darkness came on. Peering out from the edge of the dell, they could see nothing but a gray land now vanishing quickly into shadow. The sky above had cleared again, and was slowly filled with twinkling stars. Frodo and his companions huddled round the fire, wrapped in every garment and blanket they possessed. But Strider was content with the single cloak, and sat a little apart, drawing thoughtfully at his pipe. As night fell, and the light of the fire began to shine out brightly, he began to tell them ta tales to keep their minds from fear. He knew many histories and legends of long ago, of elves and men and the good and evil deeds of the Elder Days. He wondered how old he was, and where he had learned all this lore. Tell us of Gilgalad, said Mary suddenly, when he paused at the end of a story of the elf kingdoms. Do you know any more of that old, old day that you spoke of? I do indeed, answered Shredder. So also does Frodo, for it concerns us closely. Harry and Pippin looked at Frodo, who was staring into the fire. I know only th the little that Gandalf has told me, said Frodo slowly. Gilgalad was the last of the great elf kings of Middle-earth. Gilgalad is starlight in their tongue. With Elendil, the elf friend, he went to the land of... No, said Shredder, interrupting. Do not think that the tale should be told now with the servants of the enemy at hand. We win through the, to the house of Elrond, you may hear it there, told in full. Then, then tell us some of the other tale of the old days, Exam, a tale about the elves before the fade in time. I'd dearly like to hear more about elves. The dark seems to press round so close. I will tell you the tale of Tinunviel. Said Strider, in brief, for it is a long tale of which the end is not known, and there are none now except Elrond that remember it aright as it was told of old. It is a fair tale, but what is sad, as are all the tales of Middle Earth, and yet it may lift up your hearts. He was silent for some time, and then he began not to speak, but to chant softly. The leaves were long, the grass was green, the hemlock umbles tall and fair and in the glade a light was seen of stars and shadow shimmering. Tinuvel was dancing there to the music of a pipe unseen, and light of stars was in her hair and in her raiment glimmering. There Baron came from mountains cold, and lost he wandered under leaves. And where the elven river rolled, he walked alone and sorrowing. He peered through the hemlock leaves and saw in wonder flowers of gold upon her mantle and her sleeves and her hair like shadow following. Enchantment heal healed his weary feet, that over hills were doomed to roam, and forth he hastened, strong and fleet, and grafts at moonbeams glistening. Through woven, through woven woods and elven home, he lightly fled on dancing feet, and left him lonely still to roam. In the silent forest listening, he heard there off the flying sounds of feet as light as linden leaves, our music welling underground in, ho in hidden hollows quivering. Now withered lay the hemlock sheaves, 
and one by one with sighing sound, whispering fell the beechen leaves in the wintry wood and wavering. He sought her ever, wandering far where leaves of years were thickly strewn, strewn by light of moon and ray of star and frosty heavens shivering. Her mantle glinted in the moon as on a hilltop high and far she danced and at her feet was thrown a mist of silver quivering. When winter passed, she came, she came again, and her song released the sut and spring. Like rising lark and falling rain, and melting water bu bubbling, he saw the elven flower spring about her feet and healed again. He longed by her to dance and sing upon the grass untroubling. Again she fled, but swift he came. Tinuvel. Tinuviel, he called her by her elvish name. And there she halted listening. One moment stood she, and a spell his voice laid on her. Baron came, and doom fell on Tinuviel, that in his arms lay glistening. As Baron looked into her eyes, within the shadow up, oh, shadows of her hair, the trembling starlight of the skies, he saw their mirrored shimmering. Tinuviel the elven fair, Immortal maiden elven wise, about him cast her shadowy hair and arms like silver glimmering. Long was the way that f of long was the way that f fate them bore, o'er stony mountains cold and grey, through halls of iron and darkling door, and woods of nightshade moralless, the sundering seas between them lay, and yet at last they met once more, and long ago they passed away in the forest singing sorrowless. Strider sighed and posed before he spoke again. That is a song, he said, in the mode of that is called Anthanoth among the elves, but it is hard to render in our common speech. And this is but a rough echo of it. It tells of the meeting of Baron, son of Barahir, and, and Luthien Tinuviel. Baron was a mortal man, but Luthien was the daughter of Thingol a king of elves upon Middle-earth when the world was young, and she was the fairest maiden that has ever been among all the children of this world. As the stars above the mists of the northern lands was her loveliness, and in her face was a shining light. In those days the great enemy, of whom Sauron of Mordor was but a servant, dwelt in Agbond in the north, and the elves of the west coming back to Middle-earth made war upon him, to regain the similar ills which he had stolen, and the fathers of men aided the elves. elves. But the enemy was victorious, and Barahir was slain, and Baron escaped through great peril coming over the mountains of terror into the hing hidden kingdom of Thingol in the forest of Neldoreth. There he be beheld Luthien singing and dancing in a glade beside the enchanted river Esgalduin, and, and he named her Tinuvel that is, Nightingale in the language of old. Many sorrows befell them afterwards, and they were parted long. Tinuviel rescued Baron from the dungeons of Sauron, and together they passed through great dangers, and cast down even the great enemy from his throne, and took from his iron crown one of the three Cimmerils, brightest of all jewels, to be the bride price of Luthien to Thingol, her, do her father. Yet at the last... Baron was slain by the wolf that came from the gates of Angbad, Angband, and he died in the arms of Tinuviel, but she chose mortality and to die from the world, that she might follow him, and it is sung that they met again beyond the sundering seas, and after a brief time walking alive once more in the green woods, together they passed, long ago beyond the confines of this world, so it is that Luthien to Tinuviel, alone of the elf kindred, has died indeed, and left the world, and they have lost her whom they most loved, but from her lineage of the elf lords of old descended among men. There live still those of whom Luth Luthien was the foremother, and it is said that her line shall never fail. Elrond of Rivendell is of that kin, for of Baron and Luthien was born Dior Thingol's heir, and of him Elwing the White whom Arendil wedded, he that sailed his ship out of the mists of the world into the seas of heaven 
with a similar ill upon his his brow. And of Ar Arendelle came the kings of Numenor, that is, Westerness. As Strider was, was speaking, they watched his strange, eager face, dimly lit in the red glow of the wood fire. His eyes shone, and his voice was rich and deep. Above him was a black, starry sky. Suddenly, a pale light appeared over the crown of other top behind him. The waxing moon was climbing slowly above the hill that overshadowed them, and the stars above the hilltop faded. The story ended. The hobbits moved and stretched. Look, look, said Mary. The moon is rising. It must be getting late. The others looked up. Even as they did so, they saw on the top of the hill something small and dark against the glimmer of the moonrise. It was perhaps only a large stone or jutting rock, shown up by pale light. Sam and Mary got up and walked away from the fire. Frodo and Pippin remained seated in silence. Strider was watching the moonlight on the hill intently. All seemed quiet and still, but Frodo felt a cold dread creeping over his heart. Now that Strider was no longer speaking, he huddled closer to the fire. At that moment, Sam came running back from the edge of the dell. I need a little different. That's not. Sorry, I haven't. Eh. Uh. Darn it! Where was that? I was gonna use. That's not the right one. I don't know what it was, he said, but I suddenly felt afraid. I durns go outside this dell for any money. I felt that something was deep up, was creeping up the slope. Did you see anything? Asked Frodo, springing to his feet. No, sir, I saw nothing, but I didn't stop to look. I saw something, said Mary, or thought I did. Away westward where the moonlight was falling on the flats beyond the shadow of the hilltops. I thought there were two or three black shapes. They seem to be moving this way. Keep close to the fire, with your faces outward, cried Shredder. Get some of the longer sticks ready in your hands. For a breathless time, they sat there, silent and alert, with their backs turned to the wood fire, each gazing into the shadows that encircled them. Nothing happened. There was no sound or movement in the night. Frodo stirred, feeling that he must break the silence. He longed to shout out loud, First writer. What was that? Gas gasped Pippin at the same moment. Over the lip of the little dell, on the side away from the hill, they felt, rather than saw, a shadow rise. One shadow or more than one. They strained their eyes and the shadow seemed to grow. Soon there could be no, be no doubt. Three or four tall black figures were standing there on the slope looking down on them. So black were they that they seemed like black holes the deep shade be behind them. 
Frodo thought that he heard a faint hiss as a venomous breath and, a, and felt a thin, piercing chill. Then the shape slowly advanced. Terror overcame Pippin and Merry, and they threw themselves flat on the ground. Sam shrank to Frodo's side. Frodo was hardly less terrified than his companions. He was quaking as if he was bitter cold, but his terror was swallowed up in a sudden temptation to put on the ring. The desire to do this laid hold of him, and he could think of nothing else. He did not forget the barrow, nor the message of Gandalf. But something seemed to be compelling him to disregard all warnings, and he longed to yield, not with the hope of escape, or of doing anything, either good or bad. He simply felt that he must take the ring and put it on his finger. He could not speak, felt Sam looking at him, as if he knew that his master was in some great trouble, but he could not turn towards him. He shut his eyes and struggled for a while, but resistance became unbearable. At last, he slowly drew out the chain and slipped the ring on the forefinger of his left hand. Immediately, though, everything else remained as before, dim and dark. The shapes became terribly clear. He was able to see beneath their black wrappings. There were five tall figures, two standing on the lip of the dell, three advancing, and their white faces burned keen and merciless eyes. Under their man mantles were long gray robes. Upon their gray hairs were helms of silver. In their haggard hands were swords of steel. Their eyes fell on, it, fell on him and pierced him as they rushed towards him. Desperate, he drew his own sh sword and it seemed to him that it flickered red, as if it was a firebrand. Two of the figures halted. The third was taller than the others. His hair was long and gleaming and on his helm was a crown. In one hand he held a long sword and in the other a knife. Both the knife and the hand that held, held it glowed with a pale light. He sprang forward and it bore down on Frodo. That moment, Frodo threw himself forward on the ground and he heard himself cry out loud, O oh, Elberth, Gilthoniel. At the same time, he struck at the feet of his enemy. A shrill cry rang out in the night and he felt a pain like a dart of poisoned ice pierced his, his left shoulder. Even as he swooned, he, ca he caught, as through a swirling mist, a glimpse of Strider leaping out of the darkness with a, th with a flaming brand of wood in either hand. With a last effort, Frodo, dropping his sword, slipped the ring from his finger and closed his right hand tight upon it. Yes, and with as the end of chapter 11. Continuing on to chapter 12. water in the top. Very pumped into the mic. I'm not going to have to use them. I'm definitely going to be needing to use the rest, rest after the stream for sure. Okay. Chapter 12 Flight to the Ford. 
I think I'll need some different music. Like the Fords. Ford, 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 Fjord, Ford. Ford. F O R D. Uh. Um. I swear I've seen why but I can't like it. All right, we should be good now. Chapter 12, Flight to the Ford. When Frodo came to himself, he was still clutching the ring desperately. He was lying by the fire, which was now piled high and burning brightly. Three companions were bending over him. What has happened? Where is the Pale King? He asked wildly. They were too overjoyed to hear him speak to answer for a while, nor did they understand his question. At length he gathered from, from Sam that, the, it's, that they had seen nothing but the vague sh shadowy shapes coming towards them. Suddenly, to his horror, Sam found that his master had vanished, and at that moment a black shadow rushed past him and he fell. He heard Frodo's voice, but it seemed to come from a great distance, or from under the earth, crying out strange words. They saw nothing more until they stumbled over the body of Frodo, lying as as if dead, flying downwards on the grass with his sword beneath him. Strider ordered them to pick him up and lay him near the fire, and then he disappeared that was now a good while ago. Sam plainly was beginning to have doubts again about Strider, but while they were talking he appeared, peering suddenly out of the shadows. They started, and Sam drew his sword and stood over Frodo. But Strider knelt, knelt down swiftly at his side, I am not a black rider, Sam, he said gently. We were in league with them. I have been trying to discover something of their movements, but I have found nothing. I cannot think why they have gone and do not and do not attack again, but there is no feeling of their presence anywhere at hand. When he heard what Frodo had to tell, he became full of concern, and he shook his head and sighed. Then he ordered Pippin and Mary to heat as much water as he could in their small kettles, to bathe the wound with it. Keep the fire going well and keep Frodo warm, he said. Then he got up and walked away and called Sam to him. I think I understand th things better now, he said in a low voice. There seems only to have been five of the enemy. Why they were not all here, I don't know. But I don't think they, they expected to be resisted. They have dr drawn off for the time being. Not far, I fear. They will come again another night if we cannot escape. They are only waiting, because they think that their pur purpose is almost accomplished, and that the ring cannot fly much further. I fear, Sam, they believe your master has a deadly wound that will subdue him to their will. We shall see. Sam choked with, with tears. Don't despair, said Strider. You must trust me now. Your Frodo is made of sterner stuff than I had guessed. Though Gandalf hinted that it might prove so, he is not slain, and I think he will resist the evil power of the wound longer than his enemies expect. I will do all I can to help and heal him, guard him well while I am away. He hurried off and disappeared again into the darkness. Frodo dozed, though the pain of his wound was slowly growing, and a deadly chill was spreading from his shoulder to his arm and side friend washed over him, warming him and bathing his wound. The night passed slowly and, and wearily. Dawn was growing in the sky, and the dell was filling with gray light, and Strider at last returned.
Look, he cried, and stooping, he lifted from the ground a black cloak that had lain there hidden by the darkness. A foot above the lower hem there was a slash. This was the stroke of Frodo's sword, he said. The only hurt that it did to his enemy, I fear, for it is unharmed, but all blades perish that pierce that dreadful king. More deadly to him was the name of Elbereth. And more deadly to Frodo was this. He stooped again and lifted up a long, thin knife. There was a cold gleam in it. As Strider raised, they saw that near the near the end its edge was notched, and the point was broken off. But even as he held it up in the glowing light, they gazed in astonishment, for the blade seemed to melt and vanish like a smoke in the air, leaving only the hilt in, Tri in Strider's hand. Alas, he cried, it was this a cursed knife that gave the wound. Do you now have the skill and and healing to match such evil weapons, but I will do what I can. He sat down on the ground, and taking the dagger hilt laid it on his knees, and he sang over it a slow song in a strange tongue, and setting it aside, he turned to Frodo when a soft tone spoke words the others could not catch. From the pouch at his belt, he drew out the long leaves of a plant. These leaves, he said, I have walked far to find. This plant does not grow in the bare hills, but in the thickets away south of the road I found, found it in the dark by the scent of its leaves. He crushed a leaf in his finger and gave out, and it gave out a sweet and pungent fragrance. Fortunate that I could find it, for it is a healing plant that men of the west brought to Middle-earth. Athelis, they named it. It grows now sparsely and only near places where they dwelt or camped of old. It is not known in the north, except to some of those who wander in the wild. It has great virtues, but over such a wound as this, its healing powers may be small. He threw the leaves into boiling water and bathed for, for the shoulder. The fragrance of the steam was refreshing, and those that were unhurt felt their, their minds felt their minds calmed and cleared. The herb had also some power over the wound, for Frodo felt the pain and also the sense of a frozen cold lessen in his side, but the life did not return to his arm, and he could not raise or use his hand. He bitterly regretted his foolishness and reproached himself for weakness of will, for he now perceived that in putting on the ring he obeyed not, not his own desire, but the commanding wish of his enemies. He wondered if he, would, if he would remain maimed for life, and how they would now manage to continue their journey. He felt too weak to stand. The others were discussing this very question. They quickly decided to leave Weathertop as soon as possible. I think now, said Strider, that the enemy has been watching this place for some days. Gandalf ever came here, then he must have been forced to ride away, and he will not return. In any case, we are in great peril here after dark, since the attack of last night, and we can hardly meet greater danger where, wherever we go. As soon as the daylight was full, they had some hurried food and, pack, and packed. It was impossible for Frodo to walk, so they divided the greater part of their baggage among the four of them, put Frodo on the pony. In the last few days, the poor beast had improved wonderfully. It already seemed fatter and stronger, and had begun to show an affection for its new masters, especially for Sam. Bill Fernie's treatment must have been very hard for the journey in the wild to seem so much better than its former life. They started off in a southerly direction. This would mean crossing the road. But it was the quickest way to more wooded country, and they needed fuel. For Strider said that Frodo must be kept warm, especially at night, while the fire would be some protection for them all. It was also his plan to shorten their journey by cutting across another great loop of the road. East beyond Weathertop, it changed its course and took a wide bend northwards. They made their way slowly and cautiously round the, the, wet, the southwestern slopes of the hill, and came in a little while to the edge of the road. There were no signs of the riders. But even as they were hurrying across, they heard far away two cries, 
a cold voice calling and a cold voice answering. Trembling, they sprang forward and made for the thickets that lay ahead. The land before them sloped away southwards. It was wild and pathless. Bushes and stunted trees grew in dense patches with wild, barren spaces in between. The grass was scanty, coarse and gray, and the leaves in the thickets were faded and falling. It was a cheerless land, and their journey was slow and gloomy. They spoke little as they trudged along. Frodo's heart was grieved as he watched them walking beside him with their heads down and their backs bowed under their burdens. Even Strider seemed tired and heavy-hearted. For the first day's march was over, Frodo's pain began to grow again, but he did not speak of it for a long time. Four days passed, without the ground or the scene changing much, except, except that behind them, Weathertop slowly sank. And before them, the distant mountains loomed a little nearer. Yet since that far cry they had seen and heard no sign that the enemy had marked their flight or followed them, they dreaded the dark hours, yet watch in pairs by night, expecting at any time to see the black shape stalk, stalking in the, gray, in the gray night, dimly lit by the cloud-veiled moon. But they saw nothing and heard no sound but the sign of withered leaves and grass. Not once did they feel the sense of present evil that had assailed them before the attack in the dell. It seemed too much to hope the riders had already lost their trail again. Perhaps they were waiting to make some ambush in a narrow place. At the end of the fifth day, the ground began once more to rise slowly out of the wide shell valley into which they had descended. The rider now turned their course again north northeastwards, and on the sixth day, when they reached the top of a long, slow climbing slope, saw far ahead a a huddle of wooded hills. Away below them, they could see the road sweeping round the feet of the hills, and to their right, a grey river gleamed pale in the thin sunshine. In the distance, they glimpsed yet another river on a stony valley half veiled in mist. I'm afraid we must go back to the road here for a while, said Strider. We have now come to the, to the river Horwell, that the elves call Mythithel. It flows down of the, out of the Ettenmoors, troll fells north of Rivendell, and joins the Loudwater away in the south. Some call it the Grey Flood after that. It is a great water before it finds the sea. There is no way over it below its sources in the Ettenmoors, except by the last bridge on which the road crosses. What is that other river we can see far away there? Asked Mary. That is Loudwater, the Bruin Inn of Rivendell, answered Strider. The road runs along the edge of the hills for many miles from the bridge to the ford of Bruin Inn, but I have not yet thought how we shall cross that the water, one river at a time. We shall by f we shall be fortunate indeed if we do if we if we do not find the last bridge held against us. Next day, early in the morning, they came down again to the borders of the road. Sam and Strider went forward, but they found no sign of any travelers or riders. Here, under the shadow of the hills, there had been some rain. Strider judged that it had fallen two days before and washed away all footprints. No horsemen had passed since then, as far as he could see. They hurried along with all the speed they could make, and after a mile or two, they saw the last bridge ahead, at the bottom of a short steep slope. They dreaded to see black figures waiting there, but they saw none. Strider made them take cover in a thicket at the side of the road, while he went forward to explore. Before long he came hurrying back. I see no sign of the enemy, he said. I wonder very much what that means, but I have found something very strange. He held out his hand and showed a single pale green jewel. I found it in the mud in the middle of the bridge, he said. It is a barrel, an elf stone. Whether it was set there or let fall by chance, I cannot say, but it brings hope to me. 
I will take it as a sign that we may pass the bridge. But beyond that, I dare not keep to the road without some clearer token. At once they went on again, across the bridge in safety, hearing no sound but the water swirling. Swirling against its three great arches. A mile further on, they came to a narrow ravine that led northwards through the lands on the left of the road. I didn't want it to be. Here, Strider turned aside, and soon they were lost in a somber country of dark trees, winding among the feet of sullen hills. The hobbits were glad to leave the cheerful cheerless lands and the perilous road behind them, but this new country seemed threatening and unfriendly. As they went forward, the hills about them steadily rose. Here and there, upon heights and ridges, they cut glimpses of ancient walls of stone and the ruins of towers. They had an ominous look. Frodo, who was not walking, had time to gaze ahead and to think. He recalled Bilbo's account of his journey and the threatening towers on the hills north of the road the country near the Trolls' Wood, where his first serious adventure had happened. Frodo guessed that they were now in the same region, and wondered if by chance they would pass near the spot. Who lives in this land? he asked. And who built these towers? This troll country? No, said Frodo. Trolls do not build. No one lives in this land. Men once dwelt here ages ago, but none remain now. They became an evil people, as legend tells. For they fell in the sh under the shadow of Angmar, but all were destroyed in the war that brought, th brought the North Kingdom to its end. But that is now so long ago that the hills have forgotten them, though a shadow still lies on the land. Where did you learn? Where did you learn such tales? If all the land is empty and forgetful, asked Peregrine. The birds and beasts do not tell. Do not tell tales of that sort. The heirs of Elendil do not forget all things past, said Strider, and many more things than I can tell are remembered in Rivendell. Have you often been to Rivendell? said Frodo. I have, said Strider. I dwelt there once, and still I return when I may. There my heart is. It is not my fate to sit in peace, even, even in the fair house of Elrond. The hills now began to shut them in. The road behind behind held on its way to the river Bruinen, but both were now hidden from view. The travelers came into a long valley. Narrow, deeply coven, dark and silent, trees with old and twisted roots hung over cliffs and piled up behind into mounting slopes of pine wood. The hobbits grew very weary. They advanced slowly, for they had to pick their way through a pathless country encumbered by fallen trees and tumbled rocks. As long as they could, they avoided climbing for Frodo's sake, and because it was in fact difficult to find any way up out of the narrow dells. They had been two days in this country when the weather turned wet. The wind began to blow steadily out to the west and pour the water of the distant seas on the dark heads of the hills in fine drenching rain. By nightfall, they were all soaked, and their camp was cheerless. They could not get any fire to burn. Next day, the hills rose still higher and steeper before them, and they were forced to turn away northwards out of their course. Strider seemed to be getting anxious. They were nearly ten, day ten days out from Weathertop, and their stock of provisions was beginning to run low. It went on raining. That night, they camped on a stony shelf with a rock wall behind them, in which there was a shallow cave. A mere scoop in the cliff. Frodo was restless. The cold and wet had made his wound more painful than ever, and the ache and sense of deadly chill took away all sleep. He lay tossing and turning and listening fearfully to the stealthy night noises. Wind and chinks of rock, water dripping, a crack, the sudden rattling fall of a loosened stone. He felt that black shapes were advancing to smother him, but when he sat up, he saw nothing but the back of Strider sitting hunched up, smoking his pipe and watching. He lay down again and passed and 
to an uneasy dream in which he walked out the grass in his garden in the shire, but it seemed faint and dim, less clear than the tall black shadows that stood looking over the, e over the hedge. In the morning, he woke to find that the rain had stopped. The clouds were still thick. They were breaking, and pale strips of blue appeared between them. The wind was shifting again. It did not start early. Immediately after a cold and comfortless breakfast, Strider went off alone, telling the others to remain under the shelter of the cliff. Till he, he came back, he was going to climb up if he could, get a look at the lie of the land. When he returned, he was not reassuring. We have come too far to the north, he said. We must find some way to turn back southwards again. If we keep on as we are going, we shall get up into the Ettendales far north of Rivendell. That is troll country and little known to me. We could perhaps find our way through and come round to Rivendell from the north. It would take too long, for I do not know the way, and our food would not last. So somehow or other we must find the ford of Bruinen. The rest of that day they spent scrambling over rocky ground. They found a passage between two hills that led them into a valley running southeast, the direction that they wished to take. But towards the end of the day they found their road again barred from a ridge of highland. Its dark edge against the sky was broken into many bare points like teeth of a blunted saw. They had a choice between going back or climbing over it. They decided to attempt the climb, but it proved very difficult. Before long, Frodo was obliged to dismount and struggle, struggle along on foot. Even so, they often despaired of getting their pony up, or indeed, of finding a path for themselves burdened as they were. The light was nearly gone. They were all exhausted when at last they reached the top. They had climbed onto a narrow saddle between two higher points. The land fell steeply away again. Only a short distance ahead, Frodo threw himself down and lay on the ground shivering. His left arm was lifeless, and his side and shoulder felt as if icy claws were laid upon them. The trees and the rocks about him seemed shadowy and dim. I cannot go any further, said Mary to Strider. I'm afraid this has been too much for Frodo. I'm dreadfully anxious about him. What are we to do? Do you think they will be able to cure him in Rivendell if, he, if we ever get there? We shall see, answered Strider. There is nothing more I can do in the wilderness. It is chiefly because of his wound that I am so anxious to press on, but I agree that we can go no further tonight. What is the, mas the matter with my master? asked Sam in a low voice, looking appealingly at Strider. His wound is small and is already closed. There's nothing to be seen but a cold white mark on his shoulder. Frodo has been touched by the weapons of the enemy, says Strider and there is some poison or evil at works that is beyond my skill to drive out. Do not give up hope, Sam. Night was cold on the high ridge. They lit a small fire down under the gnarled roots of an old pine that hung over a shallow pit. It looked as if stone had once been quarried there. They sat huddled together. The wind blew chill through the pass, and they heard the treetops lower down, treetops lower down moaning and sighing. Frodo lay half in a dream, imagining that endless dark wings were sweeping by above him, that on the wings rode pursuers that, s that sought him in all the hollows of the hills. The morning dawned bright and fair, the air was clean, the light pale and clear in, the, in a rain-washed sky. Their hearts were encouraged, but they longed for the sun to warm their cold, stiff limbs. As soon as it was light, Strider took Mary with him and went to survey the country from the height to the east of the pass. The sun had risen and was shining bright brightly when he returned with more comforting news. They were now going more or less in the right direction. If they went on down the further side of the ridge, they would have the mountains on their left. Some way ahead Strider had caught a glimpse of the loud water again, and he knew that, but was hidden from view. The road to the ford was not far from the river and lay on the side nearest to them. We must make for the road again, he said. We cannot hope to find a path through these hills. Whatever danger may be said it, the road is our only way to the ford. As soon as they had eaten, they set out again. They climbed slowly down this, the southern side of the ridge, a 
but the way was much easier than they had expected, for the slope was far less steep on this side. Before long, Frodo was able to ride again. Bill Farney's poor old pony was developing an unexpected talent for picking out a path, and for sparing its rider as many jolts as possible. The spirits of the party rose again. Even Frodo felt better in the morning light, and every now and then, Every now and then, now and again, a mist seemed to obscure his sight, and he passed his hands over his eyes. Pippin was a little ahead of the others. Suddenly turned around and called to them. There is a path here, he cried. When they came up with him, they saw that he had made no mistake. There were clearly the beginnings of a path that climbed with many windings out of, of the woods below and, and faded away on the hilltop behind places it was now faint and overgrown, or choked with fallen stones and trees. But at one time it seemed to have been much used. It was a path made by strong arms and heavy feet. Here and there old trees had been cut or broken down, and long rock clove and or heaved aside to make a way. They followed the track for some time, for it offered much the easiest way down, but they went cautiously. Their anxiety increased as they came into the dark woods. The path grew plainer and broader. Suddenly, coming out of a belt of fir trees, it ran steeply down a slope and turned sharply to the left round the corner of a rocky shoulder of the hill. When they came to the corner, they looked round and saw that the path ran over a level strip under the face of a low cliff overhung with trees. In the stony wall, there was a door and crookedly ajar upon one great hinge. Outside the door, they halted. There was a cave or a rock chamber behind. In the gloom inside, nothing could be seen. Strider, Sam, and Mary, pushing with all their strength, managed to open the door a little wider. And then Strider and Mary went in. They did not go far, for on the floor lay many old bones. Nothing else was to be seen near the entrance, except some great empty jars and broken pots. Surely this is a troll hole if ever there was one, right, said Pippin. Come out, you two, and let us get away. Now we know who made the path. We'd better get off it quick. There is no need, I think, said Strider, coming out. It is certainly a troll hole. It seems to have been long forsaken. I don't think we need be afraid. But let us go on down warily, and we shall see. The path went on again from the door, and turning to the right again across the level space, plunged on a thick, prodded slope. Pippin, not liking to show Strider that he was still afraid, went on ahead with Mary. Sam and Strider came behind, one on each side of Frodo's pony, for the path was now broad enough for four or five hobbits to walk abreast. But they had not gone very far before Pippin came running back, followed by Mary. They both looked terrified. There are trolls, Pippin panted, down in a clearing in the woods not far below. Get a sight of them through the tree trunks. They're very large. We will come and look at them, said Strider, picking up a stick. Frodo said nothing, but Sam looked scared. The sun was now high, and it shone down through the half-stripped branches of the, of the trees and lit the clearing with bright patches of light. They halted suddenly on the edge, and peered through the tree trunks holding their breath. There stood the trolls, three large trolls. One was stooping, and the other two stood staring at him. Ryder walked forward unconcernedly. Get up, old stone, he said, and broke a stick upon the stooping troll. Nothing happened. There was a gasp of astonishment from the hobbits. Even then, Frodo laughed. Well, he said, we're forgetting our family history. These must be the very th three that were caught by Gandalf, quarreling over the right way to cook thirteen dwarves and one hobbit. I had no idea we were anywhere near the place, said Pippin. He knew the story well. Bilbo and Frodo had told it often, but as a matter of fact, he had never more than half believed it. Even now, he looked at the stone trolls with suspicion, 
wondering if some magic might not suddenly bring them to life again. You are forgetting not only your family history, but all you, have, you ever knew about trolls, said Strider. It was a broad daylight with a bright sun, yet you come back trying to, to scare me with a tale of live trolls waiting for, waiting for us in this glade. In any case, you might have noticed that one of them has an old bird's nest behind his ear. That would be an, a most unusual ornament for a live troll. They all laughed. Frodo felt his spirits reviving. The reminder of Bill's first successful adventure was heart heartening. The sun, too, was warm and comforting, and the mist before his eyes seemed to be lifting a little. They rested for some time in the glade, and took their midday meal right in the shadow of the troll's large legs. Won't somebody give us a bit of song while the sun is high? Said Mary when they had finished. He hadn't had a song or a tale for days. Not since Weathertop, said Frodo. The others looked at him. Don't worry about me, he added. I feel much better, but I don't think I could sing. Perhaps Sam could dig something out of his memory. Come on, Sam, said Mary. There's more stored in your head than you let on about. I don't know about that, said Sam. But how, how would this suit? It ain't what I call proper poetry. You understand me. Just a bit of nonsense. These old images here brought it to my mind. Standing up with his hands behind his back, as if he was at school, he began to sing to an old tune. Troll sat alone on his, steet, on his seat of stone, and munched and mumbled a bare old bone. For many a year he had gnawed its near, for meat was hard to come by. Done by, done by, gum by. In a cave in the hills he dwelt alone, and meat was hard to come by. Up came Tom with his big boots on, said he to Troll, Pray, what is yon? For it looks like the shine o my, nun my nuncle Tim. I should be a lane and graveyard, caveyard, paveyard. This been a year has Tim been gone, and I thought he were lying in, in graveyard. My lad, said Troll, this bone I stole, but what be bones that lie in a hole? Thine uncle was, was dead as a lump o' lead, afore I found his shin bone, tin bone, thin bone. He can spare a share for a poor old troll, for he don't need his shin bone. Said Tom, I don't see why the likes o' thee without axe and thieve should go making free with the, sk with the shank or, or sh in o' my father's kin. Though hand the old bone over, rover, trover. Though dead he be, it belongs to he, so hand the old bone over. For a couple of pines, said Troll and grins, I'll eat thee too and gnaw thy shins. A bit of fresh meat will go down sweet. I'll try my teeth on thee now. He now, see now. I'm tired of gnawing old bones and skins. I've a mind to dine on thee now. Just as he thought his dinner was caught, he found his hands had hold of naught. Before he could mind, Tom slipped behind and gave him the, the boot to larn on. Warn him, darn him. A bumpo the boot on the seat, Tom thought would be the way to larn him, but harder than stone is the flesh and bone of a troll that sits in the hills alone. As well set your foot to the mountain's root, for the seat of a troll don't feel it, feel it, feel it. Old troll laughed when he heard Tom groan, and he knew his toes could feel it. Tom's leg is game, since, co since home he came, and his bootless foot is lasting lame. A troll don't care, and he's still there. The bone he, the bone he boned from its owner, donor, boner. Troll's old seat is still the same, the bone he boned from its owner. Well, that's a warning to us all, laughed Mary. It is as well you used a stick and not your hand, Strider. Where did you come by that, Sam? asked Pippin. I've never heard those words before. Sam muttered something inaudible. It, it's out of his own head, of course, said Frodo. I am learning a lot about Sam Ganji on this journey. For he was a conspirator, now he's a jester. He'll end up by becoming a wizard or a warrior. I hope not, said Sam. I don't want to be neither. In the af afternoon, they went on down the woods. They were probably following the very tracks that Gandalf, Bilbo, and the dwarves had used many years before. 
After a few miles, they came out on the top of a high bank above the road. At this point, the, the road had left the Hortwell far behind in its narrow valley, and now clung close, clung close to the feet of the hills, rolling and winding eastward among woods and, and heather-covered slopes towards the ford and the mountains. Not far down, the bank strider pointed out a stone in the grass, on it roughly cut and now much withered could still be seen dwarf runes and secret marks there said mary that must be the stone that marked the place where the troll's gold was hidden how much is left of bilbo's share i wonder frodo frodo looked at the stone and wished that bilbo had brought no treasure more perilous or less easy to part with not at all he said bilbo gave it all away he told me he did not feel it was really his as it came from robbers the road lay quiet under the long shadows of early evening. There was no sign of any other travelers to be seen, as there was not, oh, no other possible course for them to take. They climbed down the bank and turning left went off as fast as they could. Soon, a shoulder of the hills cut off the light of the fast westering sun. A cold wind flowed down to meet them from the mountains ahead. They were beginning to look out for a place off the road where they could camp for the night when they heard a sound that brought sudden fear back into their hearts, the noise of hoofs behind them. They looked back. They could not see far because of the many windings and rollings of the road. As quickly as they could scramble off the beaten way and up into the deep heather and bilberry brushwood on the slopes above until they came to a small patch of thick-growing hazels. As they peered out among the bushes, they could see the road faint and gray in the failing light. Some thirty feet below them, the sounds of hoofs drew nearer. They were going fast for light. Clippity clip clip. Then faintly, as if it were blown away from them by the breeze, they seemed to catch a dim ringing as of small bells tinkling. That does not sound like a black rider's horse, said Frodo, looking intently. The other hobbits agreed, hopefully, that it did not. They all remained full of suspicion. They had been in fear of pursuit for so long. Any sound from behind seemed ominous and unfriendly. Strider was now leaning forward, stooped to the ground with a hand to his ear, and a look of joy on his face. The light faded, and the leaves on the on the bush bushes rustled softly. Clearer and nearer now the bells jingled, and clippity clip came the quick trotting feet. Suddenly into view, be below came a white horse, gleaming in the shadows, running swiftly. In the dusk, its edged all flickered and flashed, as if it were studded with gems like, like living stars. The rider's cloak streamed behind him, and his hair was thrown back. His golden hair flowed sh shimmering in the wind of his speed. To Frodo it appeared that a white light was shining through the form and raiment of the rider, as if through a thin veil. Strider sprang from hiding and dashed down towards the road, leaping with a cry through the heather. But even before he had moved or called, the rider had reined in his horse and halted, looking upwards toward the thicket where they stood. When he saw Strider, he dismounted and ran to meet him, calling out, I naive edui dunadin, my govainen. His speech and clear ring of voice left no doubt in their hearts. The rider was of the elven folk. No others that dwelt in the wide world had voices so fair to hear, but there seemed to be a note, a note of haste or fear in his call. They saw that he was now speaking quickly and urgently to Strider. Soon Strider beckoned them, and their hobbits left the bushes and hurried down to the road. This is Glorf Endel, who dwells in the house of Elrond, said Strider. Hail, and we meet, and well met at last, said Elf Lord to Frodo. I was sent from Revendel to look for you. We fear that you are in danger upon the road. Then Gandalf has reached Rivendell? cried Frodo joyfully. No. He had not when I departed, but that was nine days ago, answered Glorfindel. Elrond received news that troubled him. Some of my kindred, journeying in land beyond the Baranduin, learned that things were amiss, and sent messages as swiftly as they could. They said that the nine were abroad, and that you... You were astray, bearing a great burden without guidance, for Gandalf had not returned. There are few even in Rivendell that can write openly against the Nine. 
but such as they were, Elrond sent out north, west, and south. It was thought that you might turn far aside to avoid pursuit and become lost in the wilderness. It was, it was my lot to take the road, and I came to the bridge of Mithathil and left a token there nigh on seven days ago. Three of the servants of Sauron were upon the bridge, but they withdrew and I pursued them westward. I came also upon two others, but they turned away southward. Since then I have searched for your trail. Two days ago I found it, and followed it over the bridge, and today I marked where you descended from the hills again. But come, there is no time for further news. Since you, you are here, we must risk the peril of the road and go. There are five behind us, and when they find your trail upon the road, they will ride... They will ride after us like the wind, and they are not they are not all. Where the other four may be, I do not know. I fear that we may find the ford is already held against us. While Glorfindel was was speaking, the shades of evening deepened. Frodo felt a great weariness come over him. Ever since the sun began to sink the mist before his eyes had darkened, he felt that a shadow was coming between him and the faces of his friends. Now pain assailed him, and he felt cold. He swayed, clutching at Sam's arm. My master is sick and wounded, said Sam angrily. He can't go on riding after nightfall. He needs rest. Glorfindel caught Frodo as he sank to the ground, and taking him gently in his arms, he looked it in his face with grave anxiety. Briefly, Strider told of the attack on their camp under Weathertop, of the deadly knife. He drew out the hilt which he had kept and handed it to the elf. Glorfindel shuddered as he took it, but he looked intently at it. There are evil things written on this hilt, he said. Though maybe your eyes cannot see them, keep it, Aragorn, till we reach the house of Elrond. But be wary and handle it as little as you may. Alas, the wounds of this weapon are beyond my skill to heal. We'll do what I can. All the more do I urge you now to go on without rest. He searched the wound on Frodo's shoulder with his finger. His face grew graver as if he learned, as if what he learned disquieted him. But Frodo felt this, the chill lessen in his side and arm. A little warmth crept down from his shoulder to his hand and the pain grew easier. The dusk of evening seemed to grow lighter about him, as if a cloud had been withdrawn. He saw his friend's face more clearly again, a measure of new help and strength returned. You shall ride my horse, said Glorfindel. I will shorten the stirrups up to the saddle skirts, and you must you must sit as tight as you can. But you need not fear. My horse will not let any rider fall that I command him to bear. His pace is light and smooth, and if danger presses too near, he will bear you away with a speed that even the black steeds of the enemy cannot rival. No, he will not, said Frodo. I shall not ride him. If I am to be carried off to Rivendell or anywhere else, leaving my friends behind in danger. Glorfindel smiled. I doubt very much, he said, if your friends would be in danger if you were not with them. The pursuit would follow you and leave us in peace, I think. It is you, Frodo, and that which you bear that brings us all in peril. To that, Frodo had no answer, and he was persuaded to mount Glorfindel's white horse. The pony was laden instead with a great part of the other's burdens, so that they now marched lighter, and for a time made good speed, but the hobbits began to find it hard to keep up with the swift tireless feet of the elf. On he led them into the mouth of darkness, and still on under the, the deep clouded night. There was neither star nor moon, not until the grey of dawn did he allow them to halt. Pippin, Merry, and Sam were by that time nearly asleep on their stumbling legs, and even Strider seemed by the sag of his shoulders to be weary. Frodo sat upon the horse in a dark dream. They cast themselves down in the heather a few yards from the, right, from the roadside and fell asleep immediately. They seemed hardly to have closed their eyes when Glorfindel, who had set the, himself to watch while they slept, awoke them again. The sun had now climbed far into the morning, and the clouds and mists of the night were gone. Drink this, said Glorfindel to them pouring for each in turn a little liquor from his silver-studded flask of leather. It was clear as spring water and had no taste, and it did not feel either cool or warm in the mouth, but strength and vigor seemed to flow into all their limbs as they drank. Eaten after that, throughout the stale bread and dried fruit, 
which was now all they had left, seemed to satisfy their hunger better than many a good breakfast in the Shire had done. They had rested rather less than five hours when they took to the road again. Glorfindel still urged them on, and only allowed two brief halts during the, during the day's march. In this way, they covered almost twenty miles before nightfall, and came to a point where the road bent right and ran down towards the bottom of the valley, now making straight for the Brunnen. So far, there, there had been no sign or sound of pursuit that the hobbits could see or hear, but often Glorfindel would halt and listen for a moment. If they lagged behind, and a look of anxiety clouded his face, once or twice he spoke to Strider in the elf tongue. But however anxious their guides might be, it was plain that the hobbits could go no further that night. They were stumbling along dizzy with weariness, unable to think of anything but their feet and legs. Frodo's pain had redoubled, and during the day things about him faded to the shadows of ghostly prey. He almost welcomed to the coming of night, but then the world seemed less pale and empty. Oh, hi, Sophie, and thank you for the fluid check. Oh, and welcome in, uh, drunk otaku. Dragon be a poet. <laughs> thank you. Um. The hobbits were still weary when they set out again again early next morning. There were many miles yet to go between them and the ford, and they hobbled forward as best pace they could manage. Our power will be greatest just ere we reach the river, said Glorfindel. For my heart warns me that the pursuit is now swift behind us. Another danger may be waiting by the ford. The road was still running steadily downhill. There was was now in places much grass at either side in which the hobbits walked when they could to ease their tired feet. In the late afternoon, they came to a place where the road went suddenly under the dark shadow of tall pine trees, and they plunged into a deep cutting with steep, moist walls of red stone. Echoes ran along as they hurried forward. There seemed to be a sound of many footfalls following their own. All at once, as if through a gate of light, the road ran out again from the end of the tunnel into the open. There at the bottom of a sharp incline, they saw for them a long flat mile, and beyond that the ford of Rivendell. On the further side was a steep brown bank, threaded by a winding path. Behind that the tall mountains climbed, shoulder above shoulder, and peak beyond peak into the fading sky. There was still an echo as if following feet in the cutting behind them, a rushing noise as if a wind were rising and pouring through the branch of the pines. One moment, Glorfindel turned and listened, and he sprang forward with a loud cry. Fly, he called. Fly, the enemy is upon us. The white horse leapt forward. The hobbits ran down the slope. Glorfindel and Strider followed as rear guard. They were only halfway across the flat when suddenly there was a noise of horses galloping. Out of the gate in the trees they had just left rode a black rider. He reined his horse in and halted, swaying in his saddle. Another followed him, and then another, then again two more. Ride forward, ride, cried Glorfindel to Frodo. He did not obey at once, for a strange reluctance seized him. Checking the horse to the wasp, to a walk, he turned and looked back. The rider seemed to sit upon their great steeds. The, the riders seemed to sit upon their great steeds like threatening statues upon a hill, dark and solid, while all the wo woods land about them receded as if into a mist. Suddenly, he knew in his heart that they were silently commanding him to wait. Then, 
once fear and hatred awoke in him. His hand left the bridle and grasped the hilt of his sword, and for Red Flash he drew it. Ride on! Ride on! cried Glorfindel, and then loud and clear he called to the horse in the elf tongue, Noro Lim, Noro Lim, Asphaloth. At once the white horse sprang away and sped like the wind along the last lap of the road. At the same moment, the black horses leaped from the hill in pursuit, and from the riders came a ter terrible cry, such as Frodo had he heard filling the woods with horror in the, in the east farthing far away. It was answered, and to this may Frodo and his friends, out from the trees and rocks away on the left, four other riders came flying. Two rode towards Frodo, two gal galloped madly towards the ford to cut off his escape. They seemed to him to run like the wind and to grow swiftly larger and larger as their courses converged with his. Frodo looked back for a moment over his shoulder to no longer see his friends. The riders behind were falling back. Even the great streeds were, steeds were no match in speed for the white elf horse of Glorfindel. He looked forward again and hope faded. There seemed no chance of reaching the ford before he was cut off by the others that had lain in ambush. He could see them clearly now. They appeared to have cast aside their hoods and black cloaks. They were robed in white and gray. Swords were naked in their pale hands. Helms were on their heads. Their cold eyes glittered. And they called to him with fell voices. Fear now filled all Odo's mind. He thought no longer of his sword. No cry came from him. He shut his eyes and clung to the horse's mane. The wind whistled in his ears and the bells upon the harness rang wild and shrill. A breath of deadly cold pierced him like a spear, as with a last spurt, like a flash of white fire, the elf horse, beating as if on wings, passed right before the face of the form lost rider. Frodo heard the splash of water. It foamed about his feet. He felt the quick heave and the surge as the horse left the river and struggled up the stony path. He was climbing the steep bank. He was across the ford, but the pursuers were close behind. At the top of the bank, the horse halted and turned about, neighing fiercely. There were nine riders at the water's edge below, and Frodo's spirit quailed quail before the threat of their uplifted faces. He knew of nothing that would prevent them from crossing as easily as he had done, and he felt that it was useless tr to try to escape over the long, uncertain path from the forge to the edge of Rivendell if once the riders crossed. In any case, he felt that he was commanded urgently to halt. Hatred again stirred in him, but he had no longer the strength to refuse. Suddenly, the foremost rider spurred his horse forward. He checked at the water and reared up. With a great effort, Frodo sat upright and brandished his sword. Go back, he cried. Go back to the land of Mordor and follow me no more. His voice sounded thin and shrill in his own ears. The riders halted, but Frodo had not the power of Bombadil. His enemies laughed at him with a harsh and chilling laughter. Come back, come back, they called. To Mordor we will take you. Go back, he whispered. The ring, the ring, they cried but with deadly voices. And immediately their leader urged his horse forward into the water, followed closely by two others. By Elbereth and Luthien the Fair, said Frodo with a last effort lifting up his sword. You shall have neither the ring nor me. Then the leader, who was now half across the ford, stood up menacing in his stirrups and raised up his hand. Frodo was stricken dumb. He felt his tongue cleave to his mouth, and his heart laboring. His sword broke and fell out of his shaking hand. The elf horse reared and snorted. The foremost of the black horses had almost set foot upon the shore. At that moment, there came a roaring and a rushing, a noise of loud waters rolling, many stones. Dimly, Frodo saw the river below him rise, and down along its course there came a plumed cavalry of waves. White flames seemed to Frodo to flicker on their crests, and he half fancied that he saw amid the water white riders upon white horses with frothing manes. The three riders that were still in the midst of the ford were overwhelmed. They disappeared, buried suddenly under angry foam. Those that were behind drew back in dismay. With less failing senses, Frodo heard cries. It seemed to him that he saw beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore a shining figure of white light and behind it ran small shadowy forms waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. The black horses were filled with madness, and leaping forward in terror they bore their riders into the rushing 
blood. Their piercing cries were drowned in the roaring of the river as it carried them away. Then Frodo felt himself falling, and the roaring and confusion seemed to rise and engulf him together with his enemies. He heard and saw no more. Oh, and with that... With that, we finish... Book One of The Fellowship of the Ring. Which, let's see, first chapter of the next book is called 